So a household populated by a couple of neuroscientists and a couple of cats is a very interesting place to live. Um, it's also wonderfully nerdy. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about decision making in our house. Sometimes we use what we know to ponder the evolutionary mechanisms behind what makes our cat try to drown his favorite toy in the water bowl every day. Uh, but most of the time, we're really using everything that we know about psychology and neuroscience and models of decision making to figure out what in the world he was thinking when he made an inexplicable decision. <laughs> Occasionally, it goes the other way, too, I should say. I would never ask such a question. Yeah. I'm a workaday neuroscientist, and I study decision-making in the laboratory in animals that are trained to make all kinds of foraging decisions. And in the course of years of study like this, I become deeply aware that animals' decisions and behavior are profoundly shaped by what I will call bottom-up forces, uh, deep, basic brain things like uh, thirst and hunger and sex. Uh, and anxiety and fear and hormonal cues. And of course, as I've stayed around the Stanford faculty for three decades, uh, I've become aware that the animals in this room and on the Stanford faculty are, are driven by many of these same bottom-up forces, including many uh, cultural and cognitive biases. And I bring a little bit of a different perspective since I work with humans all day, and most of the humans I work with are pretty goal-driven. So when we create courses for professionals about things like the future of food or about the science of decision-making, all of us on the team have to keep a goal in mind. We have to be planning for the future. Um, we have to adapt to change that we don't anticipate. And it's especially important that we understand our own cognitive biases and balance for those so that we make sure we have the best content and the most representative content in our courses. So these are all top-down influences, this capacity to plan and adapt and um, change over time and be aware of biases. And to achieve the top-down goals we have, we have to overcome a lot of the things that Bill has talked about. So these are really the two poles of our evening discussions. Um, are we really free to decide? Can we really choose to pursue top-down goals? Or are we really driven by these bottom-up brain mechanisms over which we just kind of sprinkle our own narrative about free will? Um, so we take different sides in these debates sometimes. So Bill, give us your best example of bottom-up influences really driving human decision-making. Okay, so I will go to the story of Charles Whitman. Those of you who are about my age probably recognize this guy. He was the first of the modern plague of mass shooters. And in 1966, he climbed to the top of the tower at the center of the UT Austin campus. And in 90 minutes, he killed 14 people with a high-powered rifle and wounded 34 others. And of course, you know, we can't get over the shock of these things and we wonder, you know, how can this happen? How, how, how do these things actually happen? What was going on in that guy's mind? And actually, Whitman kept a diary at the time, and you can read excerpts of this out on the web. Uh, and he actually mentions his own, he, in the diary, he writes about his own violent impulses. He went to see a doctor uh, at the UT, didn't go back after the first visit. He mentions that uh, anticipating his own death, he would like an autopsy to be done, see if there's anything biological wrong with him. Uh, and many of the passages in this diary are very moving. And I'll put one up here for you. He had actually killed his wife and his mother with a hunting knife earlier in the day before he climbed the tower. And he records, it was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight. I love her dearly, and she has been as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. And then he says, if my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts, donate the rest anonymously to a foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. So uh, I think Whitman was probably onto something. He clearly sensed that he was out of control. Uh, he wanted this autopsy, and in fact, an autopsy was done. And at the autopsy, people found a tumor, okay? The doctors found a tumor deep in the middle of the brain near the conjunction of three structures called the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the amygdala. These are all structures that are known to be involved in control of emotional behavior and regulation. Did that tumor cause his behavior? We will never know the answer to that. But at least to me, it's very suggestive, and it presents uh, a, a powerful case that these sorts of deep brain mechanisms uh, may control our behavior even when we're not aware of it doing so. 
So when I see Whitman's writings, I see something a little different. Whitman is saying, it was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife. This sounds like he's kind of goal-directed. He says, I cannot rationally pinpoint a reason for doing it, but he's thinking rationally. Furthermore, he's showing evidence of long-term thinking and planning. He says, I know that um, my life is going to end, my insurance is going to come into play, and so I want it to be used to pay off my debts and to go to research. So when I look at all of this, I don't see someone who's not aware of what's going on in his brain. I see something who, someone who was very aware of what was happening in his own head. Yeah, so he's clearly aware, no contest there. But just because you're aware doesn't mean you're in control. And that's an important point that we have to, have to keep in mind. And certainly Whitman's writings don't give the flavor of someone who feels like he's free to choose in these situations. Okay, so I grant you that I think the bottom-up influences were very real in Whitman, probably due to this remarkable brain tumor. But I want to think about another group of people who are heavily influenced by these bottom-up impulses, but who managed to regain control over them um, by turning to, um, if they're if they're, addict, uh, if they're addicted to alcohol or drugs, turning to a program like Alcoholics Anonymous or another 12-step program. So, um, you know, in addiction, reward systems really run amok. Um, it's like pouring gasoline on the fire of that, that, those drives and those impulses that are coming from deep in our brains. And you can think about this just for a moment in your own reward system and how hard it is to not dip into something like this um, for us, it's french fries. For you, it might be chocolate cake or ice cream, something like this, but this is what really gets us. Um, but for, you know, for people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, those pleasure-seeking drives that we all have come to dominate their decision-making. It uh, can affect people's abilities to work, to care for themselves or their children, um, and of course, as many of us know very painfully, it can really destroy lives. So I think that taking top-down control over those really strong impulses is something that's a very courageous step. And it can be successful, as we know through programs like AA, especially when you've got that social support that reinforces a goal and instills the confidence that that goal of sobriety can be achieved. Yeah, so I agree, and AA and programs like it are really great exemplars of the fact that people can take top-down control over bottom-up, really severe bottom-up impulses. But AA is a really good example for other reasons, too. Uh, it turns out that about 40% of the people who start a 12-step program drop out within the first year. And I think that's an important piece of data. What it suggests is that different individuals may have different capacities for top-down versus top-down control over the impulses. And maybe there's actually a range of capacities here. Great point. And of course, the classic experiment on that was done at Stanford. Um, it's the famous Stanford marshmallow test, as many of you are aware. Um, so in this test, um, in 1970, the original experiment, uh, Walter Mischel and Ebby Evison brought over three to five-year-old kids from Stanford's Bing Nursery School to the lab. They invited them in one at a time and sat them down in a, in a room with no distractions, just a table and a chair, and said, here's a fluffy, tasty marshmallow. You can eat this marshmallow now, or you can wait a few minutes while I've left the room, and if you can wait till I come back, I'll give you two fluffy, tasty marshmallows. Um, so then, of course, the, having explained the rules, the experimenter leaves, turns on the video cameras, and then comes back a few minutes later uh, to see if the kids were really able to delay gratification with that kind of top-down control. Yeah, so this is a great experiment. And you know, of all the experiments in psychology, it's been re replicated many times over the years. Uh, and we're gonna show you 30 seconds of video here of kids actually participating and see which one you identify with. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, there it is. 
It's fantastic. Um, now, there, there are two fantastic things about this. First of all, it does reveal the spectrum of control that we were talking about in the context of AA. So some of these kids made it barely anywhere before they started uh, nibbling on the marshmallows, while others made it almost all the way through, but about 30% of them made it all the way through and got the two marshmallow reward. So that spectrum is point number one. But point number two, even more important, is that performance on this test at three to five years old predicted future success on SAT scores, for example, and predicted uh, future uh, run-ins with the law and adolescent behavior problems. And even when they followed some of these people into middle age, predicted activity in brain areas that are known to be involved in delayed gratification. So this is, this is a very powerful experiment. And I, I think it's very clear that there are individual differences in the extent to which we march in accordance with those bottom-up drives, or to the extent that which we're really free to control um, our own goal-directed behavior. And what's really exciting to me is that at this point in science, we've got great research going on from brain imaging to new experiments on mindfulness and what's happening in mindfulness activities to um, really sophisticated brain games that can train people to develop the neural circuitry as well as the skills that they need to um, exert more top-down influence over their own choices and behavior. So we asked at the beginning of this um, little talk, are we free to decide? And I think that the answer might be that we become freer to decide um, as we become more conscious of those bottom-up impulses that might lead us to eat the french fries or the marshmallow, but also as we more fully develop our conscious self-down control. So I think this is a really interesting perspective, a great, a great hypothesis that somehow paradoxically freedom is wrapped up with control self-control. Thank you very much. Thank you.